So we have now come to the second keynote presentation and almost at the end of our conference. So our, our second keynote is being presented by Stephen Bird, who is uh, currently at the Charles Darwin University in Australia. Well, it says everything on the slides here. S Stephen has been active in the intersection of computational linguistics and let's say language documentation, preservation, etc., for a long, long time in many universities and in several continents. And he, he already had a very nice introduction by the previous keynote speaker two days ago. So I'll, without further ado, I'll leave the floor to Stephen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, join you today and to share some of my recent thinking. It's wonderful to come to Europe and see what you're doing in Claren. The scale is impressive and anybody so committed to interoperability, I take my hat off to you. Um, it's particularly fun to see old friends and make new friends. Today I'm going to talk about the meta crisis. It's an uncomfortable topic because I think when we come to scientific meetings like this, we are taking a break from the world. According to someone who spoke to me yesterday, we are idealists. We have this, um, I suppose, technological cleanness into our world. And when we look at the world outside, it's not the same. And I'm parting with um, the tradition, but with the uh, endorsement of the organizers of this conference to talk about the meta crisis. Um, it's uncomfortable to some extent. I'm going to handle it carefully. But if this is not what you came for, then you don't have to stay or you can tune out. It's, I'm not going to be offended. I think it's just something to, um, to talk about. And I hope to have space at least 10 minutes at the end today to, to do exactly that. Uh, before I do, just um, a little bit about me. So I work in the far north of Australia. We have something like 300 languages at the time of white settlement. Here in the north, where Darwin is located, in that sort of lilac, purple area. We have dozens of languages, 14 language families, great diversity. We have a veritable bloodbath of language loss. We have 90 languages with five or fewer speakers. This is a world of, um, or a region of incredible linguistic diversity and endangerment. It's exciting to be there. Um, one of the approaches that I've been taking is language learning. So I've spent eight years trying to learn this language with 2,000 speakers. It uh, features a phenomenon called noun incorporation, which you see um, illustrated here in two equivalent sentences. Another part of the approach I've been taking is to celebrate the people who are keeping their languages strong, addressing one of the key causes of language endangerment, which is low prestige. N not access to technology, but low prestige. Um, I'm going to be making a lot of unsupported claims in my talk, but they are, um, a lot of them are su supported in these three recent articles, and um, I refer you to them. Let me also just point out that the slides are accessible from this link, bit.ly slash bird 24 So if you want to follow along at a slower or faster pace than me, um, please do feel free. <clears throat> I want to give you the image of an iceberg with the observable above the surface and the unobservable below the surface. And I want to apply it to our meeting here. So we've got the observable behaviors of this community. We, we write code, we give talks, we coordinate, we develop interfaces, we plan, we collect data. 
And there's observable motivations, which are the things people talk about, like open data, interoperable tools, and trustworthy services. This is all visible and above the water. I want to ask you what's below, out of view. What are the beliefs and values? Why do you, I mean you individually, choose to invest your life in this work? I find everybody who's in the social computing space, the digital humanities world, has an interesting story. For me, my um, interest in computing was a refuge in my teenage years from chaotic childhood and my interest in language diversity and documentation was uh, losing my grandfather before I'd recorded his voice in his, his German stories. That's deeply personal, it's different for everybody, but when I dig deep, those are the kinds of things that I come up with. Um, coming back to this iceberg image, Again, I ask, what's the underlying intention behind your actions in language resources and language technologies? For many of us, I'd say it's the public good. We have this idea that we're doing something a bit like, um, a, bit like a writing system is a public good or a, a dictionary text collection. This is the rising tide that lifts all boats. And being, seeing as we're in Barcelona, I wanted to share some photos of Barcelona with different ideas of goodness. On the bottom right is the Barcelona Lighthouse, which is a public good. You can't exclude people from it, and there's no possible rivalry with accessing this good. When you and I publish academic articles, we would like them to be that kind of good. You and I, those articles we publish, they're like lighthouses for everybody, aren't they? However, the publishing industry makes them an excludable good. So in the bottom left here, we have what are known as club goods. You need to be a member. You're excluded if you're not. Some of our trust systems, and people have been talking about trust within uh, Claren, make it a club. Uh, when it comes to publishing, if your university subscribes to one of those expensive journal services, then that university is making decisions about a finite resource. That's, that's this type. Here's a local market. These are called common goods. These are rivalrous. If your university spends money on one thing, it can't spend it on something else. The same in your projects. If, if, a, um, if a good is both excludable and rivalrous, it is a private good. And you see some super yachts parked in the Barcelona Harbour here. Um, private goods are what we are also starting to notice with the way big tech and researchers within big tech access large language models and can do state-of-the-art experiments that people outside of those organisations aren't able to do. So this is a, a sort of a clash I'm wanting to call attention to. And this is business as usual in the AI era of taking public data, or not even public data, taking data without permission necessarily, and creating an ecosystem around it to add private value. And what have we got? What have we got for this? Well, one of the things philosophers have talked about is can we set up a system of rewards and penalties, or let's say an objective function over those external behaviours, for instance, the behaviours of companies, or the behaviours of individuals, whether they act in the public or private good, but can we create rules to force people to behave in the public interest? And philosophers talk about the example of family members who will look after each other as parents would look after a child um, without regard necessarily for personal um, interest. There's a, there's a genuine sense um, that a parent would care for their child and is not being, doing this just so they don't get arrested. Um, similarly, um, looking, uh, 
very close to the bone, UN peacekeepers refusing to leave southern Lebanon right now. People in these situations, whether it's um, the family or the civic society, they show their values. And there's no system of rules on the behaviours, especially when it comes to existence. If you're putting your life on the line, there's no reward structure that's going to put in place to do that. In other words, what I'm, I'm labouring this point to say that what's above the water here and what's below the water are fundamentally different categories. And I'll come back to that. Language models, large language models, operate above the water with observable data. And when we talk about context, we talk about the context of a text. We don't talk about the context of human intent or of culture or society. So we have what I call hallucinating plagiarizing machines, which are henceforth called HPMs, using data without permissions, producing greenhouse gases, using, using up water resources, producing untrustworthy content. Why are we so excited about these? It's producing um, doom scrolling. It monetizes our attention, regardless of value, regardless of truth, regardless of benefit. It's producing content and we're attached to the content, but the content might be meaningless. It's feeding the language crisis. So for example, what I see in indigenous communities is children scrolling their phones and elders saying that children don't want to participate. But this, um, this mobile device is this perfect pill for sucking children into a porthole where they no longer participate in local society in what's meaningful locally. Research shows that when given a choice, children on devices choose entertainment over education. You have to have two people sitting at a device for that to become different. So Toyama talks about this in the context of what technology does. Ten years ago, we used to talk about the democratizing power of technology. I think, don't think many people talk like that these days. Technology no longer creates a level playing field and magnifies existing forces. And if you want to be convinced of why, here's the thought experiment that Kentaro Toyama presents to us. Suppose you give two people the identical technology Imagine these phones that these two women are used are loaded with the most amazing language technologies you could imagine. And now give them the task to raise money for a project in a week. Predict who's gonna succeed. The technology amplifies what's there in the social. There's no level playing field created by this technology. It's, it's, it's pure hype. So then we have the meta crisis. Multiple global crises. I'm the grandparent of two now. It's heartbreaking to watch. I worry about the future of my grandchildren. Global warming, sea level rise, food insecurity, loss of biodiversity, mass human migrations, depleting resources, economies that depend on growth, and in the language technology space, possibly um, content that's driving the loss of linguistic diversity, there's the radicalization of social media, and that's amplifying non-state actors who have access to technology, as we see in the US election. These crises are interconnected, feeding each other. For example, it's harder to tackle climate change when there is community fragmenting. So everyone's blood pressure's gone up when I've talked about this, I realise. By not realising or recognising the social and the cultural, technology is at best neutral and at worst harmful. And I want to bring this home. Let me say again, there's no objective function above the surface here with manipulating language data that gets to the social and cultural underneath. 
these are two different realms and it's a category mistake to link them. And so I want to ask this question for reflection. When we talk of language as, language as social and cultural data, are we making the same category mistake to put these things in the same box when they are essentially separate things? And I'm talking simply about this contrast between the observable behaviour and the underlying intent. What could we do differently? This is a bit of a doom and gloom situation, I realise. Let's look on the right here first. This is the model of a universal translation engine, bridging language barriers, helping people to connect. That's on the right. But it puts full responsibility onto the technology to convey every layer of meaning. Look at this assistive, or what's called augmentative tech intelligence model on the left, where people use a mixed language in working together. Yet there's technology supporting them, maybe with domain vocabulary. Or let's look at um, what we know on the right of information transmission. This is a version of the noisy channel model. Here are we in the world of social and cultural data, looking to electrical engineers of, the, of 1948 for a model of communication. On the left here, this is what we know about communication, that it's a co-construction of meaning. We are embodied, situated, the social dominates our conversation. Another um, design pattern which you see on the right is so-called human in the loop. The machine that we see on the um, bottom left is updating its model based on data from a human. The machine on the bottom right interrogates the model to find areas of unconfidence um, to put to the human for more menial labour. Now you could say that's expert label, that labour, that human is doing something very expert, but it's not meaningful for them. It's not connected to their agenda. And the purpose is to build the capacity of the machine and that links to what we need in this scenario. We need the machine to have maximal capacity. But if instead we center the humans and the human interaction, so this could be me interacting with a local elder who is teaching me some language. I capture some of his utterances in a device and later use it for my language learning, for example. Very natural deployment, but it's building human capacity. It's language learning. Language learning, one of the hardest things cognitively for us to do. So with this kind of position, what could we possibly do in the world of oral languages? Remembering that 90% of the world's languages have primary orality. Many of them, of course, do have a writing system, maybe created by missionaries or national governments, but the speakers of the 90% languages use another language to connect with the outside world. Where I am in Arnhem Land, those people use Gunwingu to talk to each other and they use Aboriginal English to engage with the outside world. No one in their right mind would pick up a phone and make a hotel reservation, assuming they even had a charge on their phone and credit card, and etc., and speak Gunwingu on the phone. That's not their aspiration. It's a situation of diglossia. So how do we, how could we enter this? There's various options. Possibly the best option is to leave people be. Um, many indigenous societies have only been harmed by outside engagements, even well-meaning ones. Um, they already have the contact language because of the colonial era and because of mass media, everybody knows somebody who can connect to the outside world. So let's not kid ourselves that people need our technology in order to conduct their affairs. We could do this, and this is the pattern of linguists and me included. We see languages as an opportunity ultimately for science and we recruit 
speakers of the language help us document it and we promise them, look, you'll be able to recover your language from this maybe, although we, I don't know if that's happened very often. Then there's many of us here who would seek to deploy all of our wonderful language technologies and give the world's languages the wonderful riches of all of the things we have. Why not? Um, it's a bit self-serving um, because a lot of the deployment involves capture of the data that people would disclose and they don't necessarily understand that's the uh, business model. I want to ask about what could be in here. So what's open and dynamic in this space? And so just quickly, this is what I've been looking at in years of working and living in an Aboriginal community. These are some of my adoptive mothers. And this is some of the messages that come in from outside, from experts. I'll let you read. All of these messages use a high register of English. But what's worse is that they are not situationally aware. So the bottom left one, it says, self-isolate if you develop respiratory symptoms. Self-isolate. What does that mean to self-isolate in a community where the average occupancy of a three-bedroom house is 17 and there's no food delivery services? We could talk about how to translate self-isolate as a lexical problem, but actually a um, um, situationally aware translation would say something like, stay in your family groups. Maybe, maybe that would be a biosecurity bubble or something. Let's have a closer look at this one on the top right and look at what happens if we try to use that kind of language as a basis for collecting parallel text. Here's the kind of translation you get if you ask an Aboriginal interpreter to take that message and translate on the spot uh, into a local language. All of the domain vocabulary comes straight through as the English word. People, I've asked a lot of people, one in 10 know what a catchment is the watershed of a river. However, if we do the cultural translation into plain English in the middle, let me let you, let you read. Remember I said there's di diglossia. Local people either speak Aboriginal English or they know somebody who does. And because it's a collective society, people don't act individually. In other words, all of the lexicogrammatical translation work can be done by local human capacity. This, this was done by ChatGPT which is good at translating between genres. What's very interesting is it's gone from um, a forecast which is simply stating knowledge to talking about action. And this is something in Western knowledge practices, we tend to separate knowledge from action, but in Aboriginal societies, many traditional societies, you can't talk about one without the other. We talk about knowledge practices for that reason. What I want to say to you then is that the translation task is different to what most people assume when they talk about language, sorry, uh, machine translation for all. Um, this isn't really a new idea. So, for example, back in 1929, Edward Sapir said, the worlds in which different societies live are distinct worlds, not merely the same world with different labels attached. And Nicholas Evans, writing in about 2006, said, parallel texts only address universal stories and fail to explore what is culturally specific. 
So imagine a parallel text with the lines drawn between the translation equivalent words. The, the concepts that you can get across in this translation really are the um, intersection of what's possible in both of those languages. So if there's something that's lexicalized in one language that makes sense in this culture area, then the, the only way to get a good translation is to have so much text that you can paraphrase that concept. So catchment, you'd have to, you're not gonna just get a bilingual text, you have to get a lot of translations of that. So here's what I see. It's, an interesting opportunity in the space of those 90% languages. Constructively, I want to put this to you that one way of bridging this gap between the observable forms and the underlying meanings is to allow the meaning to reside with the humans who are working together, assisted by technology that might be telling people, okay, Here's a exegesis of the concept of water catchment in your language. These are things we can build resources for, lexical, you know, multilingual oral word nets, for example. And down here is the human interaction that acknowledges all of the situational uh, logics, the relationships, culture, society, everything like that. We don't need the machine to capture all of that in order for the machine to be useful. So my observations. From the start of my talk, I pointed out that not everyone is in this space for the common good that we often would assume. And sometimes our products are getting monetized. Our attention is getting monetized. Technology used on its own does not create a level playing field. It amplifies differences. Multilingual large language models don't actually scale to the world's languages for the reasons I've just given. What scales is building human capacity. So I'm kind of sick of hearing people say, how does this scale? Building human capacity by training other people, even in the use of technology, that scales exponentially. Even if you're only teaching two other people and they teach two other people, that, that's, that has a massive impact. And the rule of uh, technology amplifying differences does not apply in that situation. That's two people, a teacher and a student, using technology to accomplish a shared goal. Speakers of small languages are usually bilingual and use a language of wider communication for accessing outside information. They don't necessarily need our MT system. There is not a cross-culturally common semantics to support machine translation, but there are bicultural people and the prospect of making more of them. Here's another version of the summary. Look on the right, this is the kind of story that many of us might have signed up to, the technology story. So I'm having the temerity to say this doesn't work and it doesn't scale. On the left is the kind of um, story I'm telling. The world is diglossic. And we don't necessarily have to target the local languages because people have their contact languages. There's functional differentiation of the different speech varieties that people have. Think of your own linguistic repertoire. Those of you who have more than one language You'll have different contexts for the appropriate use of that and different levels of, of development. When it comes to those 90% of the world's oral languages, 
there are many positions about how to develop them and we can't just make an assumption that it's all the same. Um, when we look to any remote space, any local minoritized linguistic community, there is often a reason for outsiders to come into that space. It could be de development, education, uh, law enforcement, um, community services, um, land management, all those things. In other words, when there is an intercultural interaction, there is a purpose behind it, there is a semantic domain, and there's a possibility of enhancing people's ability to communicate through translanguaging or through uh, mixing languages and uh, agreeing on particular vocabulary over time about how it can be used. Very interestingly, we can activate leaders. If you think about the complexity of the task of being a leader in this organisation or in the world at large, it involves all sorts of perception, negotiation. Um, it's a complex task. Machines won't do that. So this is the kind of agenda I'm hoping to um, encourage people to think about. If we build capac human capacity, even to the maximal agency of developing leaders, that's a way forward in our fragmented world. This is but scratching the surface. I've raised many really complex topics. Here are some resources that talk about this further in a way that's not meant to be dramatic, but meant to embrace what we can still do in organising and uh, acting in community. Um, we still have some time for questions, so let me open it up and thank you for your attention. Or, or just comments. I thank you very much for uh, uh, this presentation and here. Uh, the the last sentence you said you said you, you presented so build the human capacities. I would like to comment this by introducing uh, the concept of the fuzzy logic. So the fuzzy logic is so important in order to avoid the literal translation. Um, because fuzzy logic is contextual, con helps to contextualize um, the, the message. Um, I remember I was once uh, talking to um, a waiter in, uh, in Cannes, in France. We were both uh, speaking in French, and they asked for, some, so for something. The, the most in interesting part of his answer was what he said with his hands. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah, we tend to reduce everything to the signal, speech signal, but yes, that's embodiment. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Very, uh, a lot of food for thought. And uh, I was wondering, you at the beginning, I think without mentioning it, uh, criticized the likes of ChatGPT. And in the end of the, towards the end of the talk, you successfully used ChatGPT. And uh, so is it really the tools or is it more us? So what we do with them? Thanks for making this point. The um, example of what you're saying is something I talk about with my daughter who's just finishing a PhD in medical imaging and processing uh, rheumatology images. And um, she talks about the fact that a doctor looking at a scan with annotations can just maybe trust that and work more quickly or can question that. What do they do? I would say it depends on the surrounding human systems. If they are under time pressure or if they can be disciplined making a decision, then those human systems are going to push it one way. So it's all about the, it's all about the social.
Yes, thank you very much for your talk. I uh, really liked this um, separation between form and meaning. Um, and I agree with you that uh, for such oral um, languages, let's say, and um, what you are saying, it's perfectly right, but we should not forget that, especially in the Western societies, let's say, there are a large still communities of monolingual persons, especially in the elder, elderly generation, for whom, of course, this technology is not perfect, but still gives access to a broader information. So how would you comment this, this part of the story? This kind of story I was telling was really for those oral societies outside the top 500 institutional languages where there are very reasonable aspirations for you know translation technology using a standardized orthography and I I'm not going to um, I don't have any problem with that story but my problem is that this story is sometimes assumed to be the universal story but also even in the sort of societies you're talking about those oldest generations we can often focus so much on the linguistic um, um, facility of the individual but if we focus on the social we recognize this person is in a small social network and the linguistic capacity of the social network is the union and they just need to have a close family member who can you know let them know a storm is coming, for example. They don't need to be responsible to discover that themselves because their only connection is via a machine. Does that help? I, lo I love the way you said that. So we transform language into data, and by this we contribute to this, I don't know, creating another monster that is sucking our children into. Um, as a mother, I know I, I really feel this, so, and I'm struggling with it. So I'm, I'm wondering, what is the point? How can we find more value in what we are doing now? And how do we re reset? Thank you for that question. I don't know. But <laughs> I think we look to our networks that we have, and the, there's resources here, for example, that talk about things to do. It's about creating community. I think it's about acting to create the sort of community that we want. I don't know what that would mean in the context of Clara. And one, one thing is one can talk about ethical matters, but often that gets reduced to how to computationally implement something, which is just more of the problem that, we, that got us here. So... Um, Maybe it's looking at leadership. Who, who, um, who wants to talk about these topics? Who wants to talk about uh, what levels of uh, communication and organisation can support coordinated action? I mean, what, what's here is a story about language learning by people. That's a very concrete thing one can do. Imagine a world where most people, lifelong, are learning more languages. Imagine that would do for our cultural understanding. Compared to the world where we say, oh, thanks to large language models, we don't need to learn other languages anymore. Look at that world. We get to decide, and I think I will close with this idea, Indigenous people often, resilient Indigenous communities who exist to today mm -hmm. after centuries of colonial oppression, do so only because they are selective about what they take in from outside. We, we click through those user agreements without realising what we're losing sometimes. But I think the example from Indigenous people is to have um, respect for the elders, respect for the country, slow process, community decision making, no individualism, all of that, and then to um, build this meaningful, relational society. Wonderful closing words. Thank you.